What got you there with got you got you What got you there with Shonda Laney got you there with Shonda Laney What got you there with Shonda Laney got you there with Shonda Laney What got you there with Shonda Laney Investor Brent Bishore is the founder and chief executive officer of Adventures, a Midwestern based private equity firm. You can check them out at adventure.es. His firm takes a long-term approach to lower middle market private equity, investing permanent equity in small to mid-sized privately held companies throughout North America. Prior to founding the firm, Mr. Bishore was an entrepreneur and operator. On this episode, Brent uncovers how they evaluate companies, how to build a great team, learning humility through his own shortcomings, and taking advantage of luck. They also discuss some books and articles that have changed his life and even answer some questions that our listeners have sent in. Get ready for another jam-packed episode with legendary investor Brent Bishore. Each week, so many amazing podcasts come out. Unfortunately, we just don't have the time to listen to them all. That's why I love Podcast Notes. What Podcast Notes does is they write up some of the top podcasts and top episodes with their tips, takeaways, and quotes so you get everything you need out of that episode without having to spend all that time listening. They also have an unbelievable weekly newsletter. And this weekly newsletter has the takeaways from the top business, health, and lifestyle podcasts. It's one of the few newsletters I subscribe to and certainly think you guys would love checking it out. So remember, it's podcastnotes.org and also subscribe to that weekly newsletter they're putting out. Making change transpire. That's the mission behind the most amazing tasting protein bar brand taking the nutrition industry by storm. That brand They're MCT Co., and they make the most delicious, keto-friendly, all-natural collagen protein bars. If you're obsessed with the quality of food going into your body like I am, then head out and pick up these amazing bars jammed with 10 grams of collagen protein. They only have two to three net carbs, no added sugar, and loaded with high-quality MCT oil for the healthy fats from coconuts. Whether you're busy running the kids around from activity to activity, a professional athlete, or just someone looking for a great tasting convenience snack, do yourself a favor, head to mctco.com and use code WGYT for 20% off your order. Do you guys miss your favorite childhood cereals but had to give them up because of all the sugar? Meet Catalina Crunch, the world's first keto-friendly, zero-sugar cereal in delicious dark chocolate, cinnamon toast, maple waffle, and honey graham. When the founder of Catalina Crunch was diagnosed at age 17 with type 1 diabetes, he set out to satisfy his chocolate craving and create his own. This low-carb, zero-sugar cereal will power you through the day with 10 grams of plant-based protein, 6 grams of fiber to fill you up and is also gluten-free, grain-free, dairy-free, and 100% plant-based. Don't forget about that turmeric as well to help fight inflammation and boost immunity. If you want to enjoy and receive 10% off your entire order, head to CatalinaCrunch.com. That's Catalina, C-A-T-A-L-I-N-A, Crunch.com, and use code WGYT10 for 10% off. I just finished snacking on some of the dark chocolate, and it was delicious. You guys need to head out and pick some up today. Brent, welcome to What Got You There. How are you doing today? Hey, thanks, John. Good. Doing great. Well, I always love starting at the start of your day. So what does a typical morning look like? Is there anything you're doing to get that momentum going? Well, we'll see. So I have uh, three little girls, uh, almost five, almost three, and seven months. So um, the start of my days look different (laughs) right now. Um, I usually, uh, I I get up, I typically like to uh, uh, make some coffee and then I read and pray. That's kind of the way I always try to start off my morning. That can be as long as an hour and a half or as short as about uh, two or three minutes. So (laughs) it depends on who's up and kind of how the helter skelter is beginning. Yeah, father of three. I cannot imagine that is easy. Uh, I'm a recent father with a one-year-old, so maybe we can dive into that a little bit later. I'm curious though, you mentioned it could be only reading for two minutes or even an hour and a half. If you have no interruptions, what do you prefer? 
Yeah, so I, I usually have two or three books going on at any given time, and I'm usually reading, you know, a pretty wide variety. Some of some in business, uh, some biographies. You know, I like to read about my faith and different aspects like that. So uh, it could be the Bible, it could be a business book. It just really depends on kind of whatever whatever's catching my fancy. I'm interested. Obviously, the morning is kind of going to be helter skelter all over the place. What about later on in the day? Maybe when you're more protected being at the actual office, are there any non negotiables you have or, or just frameworks and structures you've created? Boy, you know what? Not really. Uh, honestly, when I'm at the office, it's typically going to be conference calls and meetings. Recently, it has just been uh, going as hard as we possibly can. So I, I yearn for the days of being able to uh, have a quiet moment at the office, but that hasn't been anytime soon. So during times like that, when you're just kind of trying to keep your head above water, how do you find ways to step back and view your business from a 30,000 foot perspective? Yeah, I mean, the people we have uh, on the team are just fantastic. I mean, uh, a lot of it is bringing perspective to each other. So, um, I mean, maybe it sounds cliche, but, you know, really it's just grabbing somebody and saying, hey, I, you know, I'm having an issue. I feel like things are out of control or I feel like uh, I'm too in the weeds on this. Will you help me take a step back? And, and we just help each other. Yeah, the the people you surround yourself with are going to be key. I'm hoping we can dive into that as well. But I'm really interested. What did you think you were going to be as a kid? (laughs) Well, uh, I always like to talk way too much. And so people people thought I probably was going to either be a lawyer or maybe uh, get into politics. I had no idea what I wanted to do as growing up. Uh, Until I... Uh, my mid twenties, I didn't really even know what I wanted to do uh, in general, and and I'm still trying to figure it out. So I, I kind of I, mean, I joke that I'm the the Forrest Gump of private equity. I kind of fell backwards into it, and you know it has been a uh, uh, it has been a wild and winding winding road. So no, I had no no grand plans, and in fact, I, I still don't have any grand plans. I'm really intrigued by you said even during your early and mid twenties, you weren't exactly sure what you were going to do. And I know we have a lot of young listeners, and and they reach out about those questions that they're really yearning for finding what's next and and finding what they do really well. So during those early days, what were you even doing? Were, were there certain things you were reading, conversations you were having to broaden your horizons, anything like that? You no, know, honestly, I, I'm not one of these guys that studied investing from an early age. I, I honestly didn't even really study, um, you know, Buffett until my kind of like, gosh, mid twenties. Didn't even know the name Munger until probably late twenties. Um, honestly, I, uh, I was getting my law degree, my MBA at Mizzou when I met my wife, who's getting her PhD, and um, you know, I just I felt this, you know, real push to do something other than school. And a lot of it was driven out of arrogance and pride. So I took the leap and, and, and basically just, you know, I jumped, as I you know, joke that jumped into the night fight, you know, it's just a daily, you get out of bed and try not to get killed and get back into bed and do it all over again. <laughs> and so, no, in terms of like the reading and learning, like I, I was way behind the curve. I mean, I really, until I had bought the first business and had gotten everything kind of stabilized and we were doing better. I mean, I, I really didn't feel like I had the margin to study, which was a huge problem. And it was something that uh, I certainly wouldn't recommend, but I've always just been sort of action oriented and, and far less introspective than I should have been. And so I've had to learn the other side. Do you think that actually turned out to be more of a strength for you then not having the time to study? Uh, no, I don't think, I don't think being an idiot is a, an, a, an educated idiot is a, uh, is a probabilistically good path to go down. No, I mean, I, I, I think it was a huge weakness and I think, I mean, you know, it's just weird how life turns out, but certainly, you know, God's given me the the freedom and the the a little bit of perspective now to realize how important it is to learn from other people's mistakes, and that, you know, uh, I'm not even nearly the smartest person in, in in virtually any room that I'm in, let alone in the world. And so, being able to take a step back and learn from the very best. I mean, I I, I relish my times now reading and and thinking and getting to have conversations with people who've been there and done that. It's uh. Um, you know, far better than hitting your face on the pavement repeatedly. So then what do you, how do you articulate it as what you do today? Well, so we, we, we describe ourselves as we're a family of companies that buys family owned companies. Um, technically we're private equity now. So we have private equity funds and we raise money from investors and acquire uh, small privately held family operated companies and uh, do it in a way that's a much kinder, nicer, gentler version of private equity. So um, we have seven, soon to be nine companies in the portfolio. And um, yeah, it's just, it's, it's, it's been amazing. Yeah, I'm always intrigued by just the, the number of businesses you're looking at, mostly in a yearly perspective or yearly basis. So throughout a year, how many different individual businesses are you actually looking at? 
Well, so as a team, uh, we'll see a little over 2,000, 2000 opportunities a year. Um, a lot a lot of those, you know, we can we can almost immediately throw out. Um, so we, we make a big distinction between a sustainable business and a hustle. So a hustle is all about a single person. They're the linchpin in the organization. It's basically their, you know, expertise, their relationships, their knowledge that they have that they extend to an organization that helps them uh, helps them prosper. That's very different than a business that has systems and, and, and sort of a diversity of relationships. Um, it's sustainable beyond the the owner. So most of the businesses that we see in our segment of the market are hustles, and we can throw them out pretty quickly. When you come across something that's not a hustle, what what are the next steps for you? How are you digging a little deeper to find out more? Yeah, well, so we we have a checklist. Um, I'm a big fan of checklists. Um, I mean, I think uh, again, this is a, a reading thing. Uh, when I read the checklist manifesto for the first time, I told Gawande's book, um, it sort of changed my life. <laughs> right? I can remember uh, reading it, and I was like, that is so simple and straightforward, yet it makes complete sense. And how many times have I been an idiot because I don't have a checklist in front of me? Um, and so, um, you know, we just have a checklist of, you know, do the sellers actually want to sell? Um, are all the owners on board? Do they meet our financial criteria? Are they in an industry and a business model that we can understand? Do we feel like the the industry is changing at a pace that we can comprehend? Do we feel like we can kind of see where the competition level is? So we're looking for um, sort of low customer satisfaction industries, low professionalism industries, and high fragmentation industries. And, and um, you know, it sounds like a needle in the haystack. And to be honest, it, re- it really is. I mean, out of the 2,000 or a little bit more businesses that we'll see a year, we get really serious about probably less than 20. Um, so it's really, really difficult. Yeah, it really seems like you've carved out a pretty specific niche. And so I'm really wondering here, it really sounds like you've narrowed in your circle of competence. So how did that niche really come to be? Did you start off the business with, with that identification in mind? Oh heck no! No no no! My my entire uh, my my entire journey has been haphazard at best. Um, it has just been do more of what works and less of what doesn't, and it's really just that simple. Like you get to any point in time, we've never had a plan. I think that's probably a big strength of ours. Is um, you know we've always just looked and said, okay, where are we? What resources are at our disposal? Um, where do we think the opportunity is? And then you you know move into where you think there's more opportunity and step away from areas with less opportunity. I always just have so much respect for anyone who can run a successful business. And one of the big missing pieces I feel like that keep coming up during conversations like this or or even in those those business biographies is you look back and you talk about some of those those early days, whether they be wins or losses. Do you have any big stories from those early days? You mentioned you didn't have much of a plan. So I'm wondering what that looked like for you. Yeah, no, I mean, I, it, it's a lot of luck. Um, it's a lot of luck, and I think being able to take advantage of luck when it smacks you in the face. Um, so yeah, to, to take you back, I mean, I so I did my law degree, my MBA. Um, my wife had a couple years left on her PhD. Uh, I started a, a kind of a small handful of regional marketing companies, and then I had a mutual acquaintance who said, "Hey, you should meet this guy. He got left at the altar for the second time." And I said, "Oh, well, clearly that means I should go try to buy his business because why else would you tell me he'd been left at the altar for the second time, right?" Um, that guy had no idea. And so I meet with the, the, the gentleman that owns the business and I say, you know, uh, sir, I want to buy your business. And I don't, you know, maybe you haven't seen a picture of me, but I look like I'm about, I don't know, 23 or 24. Now I look like I was about 14 then. And, uh, you know, the guy said, what are you talking about? Like two grown men have tried to buy my business. How are you going to buy it? Said, I don't know, but I'll figure it out. And we negotiated and, and, uh, we ultimately came to the conclusion that there was no way a deal would ever work. He wanted way too much money in my opinion. And I wanted to give him way too less or way too little, I should say. And, um, so we didn't talk. And then seven months later, he called me up and said, we just renewed our largest account. Business is in great shape. Uh, it's going to be all yours, but you got to close all cash 60 days from now. And at the time, like we were just, we were growing as, a, as an organization. There was a lot of helter skelter going on and <laughs> I don't know how else to say it other than I just felt a real peace about going after it. Um, got an SBA loan and um, gosh, bought the business and did real well with it. And so this is kind of one of those things where, you know, did I plan? I, you know, heck, I did the deal almost accidentally and I didn't even know there was an industry called private equity when I did the deal and found myself in a position where we did really well with it. And, and uh, that led into, hey, we should probably do more of that. I wonder what the opportunity is. And that's what stumbled into AdVentures. How did the SBA loan come to be? Was that the only thing you were even aware of at the time? Well, there's not very many ways to finance a small business acquisition. So if you look at it, I mean, the, the, the options were friends and family money. There's no way that uh, 
I would be able to get together the, the type of money that, that, <laughs> that I wanted to get together. Um, and so just, you know, had an existing relationship with the bank and, um, they said, look, we believe in you enough to do this. Um, but, uh, we're gonna get SBA protection on it. And I said, of course, and, um, thank goodness for that program. I wouldn't be in a business if it wasn't for it. What was that light bulb moment where you realized, well, why don't I keep doing this? Um, I think whenever you experience uh, far more success in something you do that's new than you have in the past, then you say, well, why wouldn't we do more of that and less of the stuff that's in the past? And so had started some companies, um, you know, moderately successfully, but nothing that, you know, light the world on fire. And then, you know, did real well with this business. And so was able to grow it and, um, you know, grow profits and uh, pay off the loan early and, you know, gosh, said, well, why wouldn't we do more of that? And that's what led into, well, I wonder how many of these businesses are out there and who owns them and all these things that led into the thesis of adventures. I mean, you mentioned you started some other businesses prior to adventures. So what are some of those difficulties? Why didn't some of those become more successful than they were? I mean, me leading them combined with a terrible business model. I mean, I had no idea what I was doing. Um, you know, when you first get into business, you have no idea about how to charge people and things that should be easy or hard and things that are really hard you think are easy and, you know, uh, hiring, you have no idea what you're doing, compensation, incentives. I mean, everything is new. And so you just make a ton of mistakes. So you focus on the wrong things. Um, you know, you do things you shouldn't have and, and, um, you know, I made all the mistakes. And so, I mean, why weren't they bigger? Because I was an idiot. You know, it's a recurring theme in my life. <laughs> so, so I'm intrigued then when you're you're becoming less of an idiot here and, and you're learning and you talked about Buffett and Munger, those didn't come till later. So can we talk about when you first realized that you really needed to start developing this knowledge base around your business? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it was when we first started making money and I was like, huh, this works. Uh, I wonder how we could do more of it. And, um, you know, now we've got some extra, I mean, I live in Columbia, Missouri, uh, which has like one of the lowest cost of living in the country. So frugal lifestyle and was making good money and, uh, said, gosh, I, I wonder how other people take small amounts of money and turn it into more money. Should probably go study those people. Right. And it turns out there's a whole group called investors. Um, and certainly Buffett and Munger, obviously amongst the Pantheon, but there's far more than that. Right. I mean, you know, you, uh, you look at what Markel's done, uh, you look at, um, uh, well, I mean, gosh, there's, there's so many Teledyne. Uh, I mean, there's a guy in Texas that I just love named Andy Beal, Beal Bank. Um, I mean, you study all these kind of under the radar, uh, people who've done really well and you say, okay, how did they do it? And why did they do it? And what was their kind of their core thesis? And everyone's got kind of a different thesis. And so like anything else, when you're younger, I mean, um, was it Bob Dylan who, who basically, who said, uh, you know, the, uh, good artists borrow, great artists steal. Right. I mean, he just you start ripping off your, you know, your idols and you say, OK, well, I think I can apply that same philosophy down market. And then over time, you know, you make it your own. Right. So I would say we're doing things very differently now than Buffett and Munger did them. Um, but, you know, initially it was like late 20s. Um, you know, I did things I thought in terms of Buffett and Munger. Right. And you thought in terms of Henry Singleton, Teledyne, you think in terms of Howard Marks. Right. So you study the greats and then you emulate them. And then eventually over time, you develop your own. Um, style, I guess you can call it. Yeah, your own style, that core thesis you mentioned. Were you quickly putting things down on paper and, and really codifying them? Or did that come much later? Yeah, I mean, I, I would say I've always had a... Uh, it's always helped me think to, to write. I mean, I, I think that it's... Uh, if you can't explain it to somebody else, then, then do you really know it yourself? And so, um, yeah, I've always had this kind of desire to... To put things on paper. I mean, I didn't start publishing a lot of stuff until probably six or seven years ago. And, um, have, you know, we obviously publish a lot more now today. So, yeah, I'm, I'm glad you're doing that because a lot of your articles are incredibly insightful and both entertaining reads. I'm interested, though, about your journaling, your writing process. When you're sitting there reading a book, what does that note taking look like for you? Gosh, that's a great question. Um, you know, I am typically reading physical books. So I'm trying to um, uh, take notes in the margin. And, um, I, you know, after time, I'll take some, some sort of digital notes of the highlights of the book. But for the most part, I'm just writing in the margin, marginalia and asking myself questions and trying to sit with it and digest it. So it's, you know, I don't think it's, you know, there's no secrets to it. Just do whatever works. Um, I mean, the biggest thing is there's no reason to read a book just to check a box. So, you know, it's all about reading and absorbing and asking, you know, yourself the tough questions that I think you should. I mean, if you can do that, then whatever way in which you, um, 
you know, gets the job done is the right way. When you say ask yourself the tough questions, can you go a little further on that? Yeah, I mean, so, so if you think about, you know, a book is just a conversation you're having with the author. I mean, the author, if, if you're reading a book, you know, worth anything is going to ask you some tough questions that make you reconsider, you know, is your strategy the right one? Are you thinking about things the right way? And so I think that, you know, it's a natural outcropping of any sort of reading exercise to have a list of questions that are generated by the book. Um, and maybe a lot of them are very straightforward, but many of them are not. Any ideas come to mind for you of something that you've read, a tough question you were wrestling with where you've changed your view on it recently? Gosh, something recently that I've changed my view on as a result of something I've read that is very specific. Gosh, I'm going to have to think through. I mean, I'm changing my mind on things all the time. I'm not sure, though, that I have a... I mean, you can take that broader and it doesn't have to be in the, (laughs) the near recent past. It could just be something, a conversation you've had, something you've read where it kind of really shifted a direction you were going. Yeah, I mean, I, I, re- I think the first time I read the Howard Marks letters, so so uh, Howard Marks is the the founder and, and chairman of Oak Tree uh, Capital, and he has a book called The Most Important Thing Illuminated, um, which is a, is, a, is a great book. It's kind of a summary of some of his best thinking in the letters, but the letters are so much deeper and richer than the book. Um, and I, I really encourage the, the, the listeners to, to read his letters. Like if you print them all out, they're all available for free. Um, you just, you know, t- t- Google, uh, uh, Howard Marks letters, uh, and they should pop right up. If you print them out and put them into binders, it's like two humongous binders, maybe even three now. And, uh, especially the earlier ones are just chock full of, really excellent thinking around risk. I mean, I think that's the thing that I think about with with Marx is just he is so excellent at articulating what is risk, how to think about risk, how to protect against risk, um, the opportunity costs of risk. And so, you know, when I read his letters for the first time, which is probably, gosh, I would say late 20s, probably late 20s, kind of in that, in that, you know, early 30s, late 20s, um, it really changed the way that I thought through risk in our own business and how we thought about deal risk and um, how to mitigate against it and just being more hyper aware of risk than I had been in the past. I'd love for you to even dive deeper. Obviously, you mentioned taking someone else's ideas and then kind of turning them and codifying them into your own. So what do they look like now for you around risk? I mean, I think risk always in my business starts with price um, and then it probably ends with people. So, um, you know, the same situation could be risky for for, for one group um, based on who's in control and highly de-risked based on uh, another group who's in control. But it always starts with what's the entry price. I and mean, if you're going to acquire a company, um, if you pay you know two times uh, what somebody else would pay for it, there's a lot more risk in the deal going bad. Um, you know, just the higher the price you pay, the more risk there is just inherently. Um, you know, how you can attract and retain talent and the relationship you can develop, I think really matters to the outcomes. And then of course, it's always in comparison to opportunity costs. So, um, you know, should you do something or should you not is all based on what other options do you have for your capital and your time and your talents. And, um, it's, it's individual and this is what makes the economy. It's just all individualistic. So, um, you know, we think a lot about uh, this idea that, you know, many more things can happen than will happen. And you got to make sure you're hyper aware of all the, the possibilities and try to at least assign a rough, um, you know, probability, probability theory to, to each, you know, what is the odds that something would happen? Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's just it's a kind of an ongoing evolution in every situation. I mean, there's no formula. It's just you're trying to gauge. Uh, what's the upside, what's the downside, and, and and what's the entry price? Yeah, you mentioned an ongoing evolution. And I'm wondering, do you really think risk can fully be learned at a younger age, or do you think it has to do with more experience? I mean, I, I, certainly experience is, is, I think, the dominant way in which you're going you're gonna to really appreciate risk. Um, you know, you can, <laughs> you can read about people touching hot stoves, uh, but until you felt the pain, um, I, don't, I don't think that uh, it, it means as much. So, I mean, certainly, um, I, I think it's a combination of both. I mean, if you only learned through experience, I mean, we'd all be dead, right? Um, and if, uh, you know, if you never had the experience, I don't think you'd, you'd, you'd be too good either. So, I mean, I genuinely, I think, you know, the, the idea, though, is over calibrating to your experience also can have a negative effect. I mean, this is where you see a lot of older people who um, won't take any risk because um, they've gotten burned in the past. And I think that's the wrong way to look at it as well. 
Yeah, you mentioned touching the hot stove, and I'm thinking about learning through your own shortcomings. And, and something I'd really like to hit on with you is humility. You seem to have a tremendous amount of humility, and I've had a lot of listeners actually bring that up, but you've openly admitted this wasn't the case early on for you. So then how'd you learn that humility through your shortcoming? I mean, I had a lot of people who uh, surrounded me who, who uh, lovingly corrected me. Um, and I think that um, realizing that pride is uh, the most destructive thing that you can have in anyone's life. I mean, it's just, it's, it's, it's offensive and it, it's just, it, it's awful when you see it in others and when you, when you don't even realize you have it in yourself. And we, of course, we all have pride, right? I mean, uh, true humility is not just thinking less of yourself, right? I mean, this is the, this is the, um, uh, C.S. Lewis has some incredible quotes on this, right? It's thinking about yourself less. And what that really means is the person who is, um, I guess you would consider overly humble or falsely humble or has a lowly opinion of themselves, that's not real humility. That's just another form of pride. It's just thinking about yourself and just thinking less of yourself. Um, the real key is um, being focused on others and being focused on a, a proper view of yourself, which is that I am an idiot, and I'm an idiot that God loves anyway, uh, which is fantastic. And it's a you know it's a gift that's freely given uh, by grace alone, and that you know really transformed my life. And I mean that was uh, I think the major catalyst in in realizing that you know I'm an idiot, but that's okay. Like we're all idiots. Um, and you know your your job is not to um, pretend like you're not, or to think highly of yourself. It's it's just to think about yourself a lot less and try to be focused on others, which is something I do terribly all the time. Right. Um, and it's just a matter. It's a, it's a slow journey. Um, but it's something that, you know, I had a lot of people around me that loved me and, um, stuck with me and, you know, hopefully I've gotten a little less offensive over time. Yeah. A quote that's on the other side of that coin is never underestimate the man who overestimates himself. So, so I'm wondering, there's so many times where it's counterproductive to have that excessive self-regard but there are also many success stories from that overconfidence. So for you early on, how much do you think your success was due to that overconfidence and self-belief you had? I would never have done a lot of the stuff I did if I knew how hard it was going to be or if I um, <laughs> properly had assessed my own capabilities, for sure. No, no doubt on that front. Um, what, what I would also say is that that's not a probabilistically good way of going about life. Right, like stumbling into success, uh, you know, driving the clown car into the gold mine is not a repeatable strategy. Um, and so, you know, e even though I would attribute uh, the success to that, I mean, part of it is a selection bias issue, right? Like, I'm you only have people on podcasts who have had some level of success, and so if you look at all the people that maybe uh, you know had the same lack of self awareness that I had early on, but just the you know the ball bounced the other direction, they're not on podcasts. So your listeners got to be really careful with there are a lot of people who would say, well, yeah, I lucked into success and you want to be arrogant and overconfident. And it's like, no, you don't. That's not the way <laughs> that is not the way to do it. Probabilistically, you're going to fail and it's going to be miserable and and it's going to be a, you know, a ruinous outcome for your life. Just because a few people have occasionally gotten lucky and maybe I'm one of them is not a good reason to be an idiot. It's such a great point. I'm so glad you brought that up. It makes me it makes me pause and think for a second. So I'm, I'm really glad you brought that up. We did speak about Buffett and Munger and just around their thoughts on compounding of knowledge and understanding. And I know you mentioned some reading. What else are you doing just to, to broaden your knowledge and your overall understanding? Yeah, I mean, I, I love any more to have. I mean, I still love to read, right? Um, uh, but, you know, with three young kids and, and the business uh, in the stage you're in, I, I don't have nearly as much time to read anymore. Um, I love having conversations with people that are uh, at the top of their game and who are um, deeply thoughtful about the philosophy underlying their business and life. And so, um, you know, I've been fortunate to collect a number of those people and and like to have frequent conversations with them. And so, um, you know, I, I'm looking forward to having one this afternoon with somebody who I you know deeply respect who uh, is, is is grinding through on his business and um, you know just planning on having a nice relaxed. Uh, probably hour long discussion. Can you expand on the philosophy side of that? Well, I mean, I think there's there's two types of people. There's people who uh, all have philosophies. It just met, you know, it just matters the depth of your philosophy. So we're all doing stuff. Uh, we all do stuff for a reason. Um, how deeply do you think about the reasons why you do it, and how front and center do you keep that? 
And I think there's just um, you know two kind of fundamentally different types of people: people who who think a lot about the underpinnings of why they're doing what they're doing, and people who are happy and and perfectly fine to do this, just to go about their day with sort of a less um, thinking along those lines and more focused on the doing. And so for me, uh, you know, it's much more helpful to talk to people who um, are much more philosophy focused, just because. Uh, uh, that's the only thing I can take away when I'm having conversations with somebody. I, you know, it doesn't help whenever I ask them, what'd you do today? And they say, well, I did this and this and this. And I say, okay, great. Why? And they're like, I don't know. Right. I mean, you, you gotta know, you gotta know why you're doing stuff. And so, um, yeah, we just be, be talking to people who think deeply about what they're doing. You mentioned you love those conversations with people at the top of their game. That's a, a big reason I love this podcast and have a lot of conversations with people across vast different domains who in some in a field outside of investing have you come across that you're really appreciative of what they do, where they're just world class and it and really inspires you? I mean, this is going to be in the field of religion, but uh, there's a gentleman by the name of Tim Keller who is just absolutely um, lights out. He's a pastor. He's now actually a retired teaching pastor from New York City. Um, written a lot of books and and uh, yeah, I listened to a ton of sermons. You can you can Google him and find. But he's just he's winsome. He's thoughtful. He brings a depth um, that's just really uh, highly unusual, and um, you know, big, big big influence on on me and and the business both. What about just your overall skill acquisition? And so we we've talked a lot about what you're actually doing day to day in your business world. What about if there's something just you enjoy as a hobby? When, you, when you're taking on a new task, what does that look like? Well, anymore, it's interesting. I'm kind of moving the opposite direction. Like we're, we're getting big enough now or we're bringing in specialists and uh, I'm doing kind of less and less. I still do experimental things in the business. Uh, I like to play around, you know, with different ideas and, you know, what could be and what if we did this or that. But um, anymore, I mean, I am... Um, really trying to focus on uh, becoming the best at the things that I'm going to do for the organization and letting others step up and, and be the best at what they do and um, kind of letting them take the lead and run with it. So it sounds weird to say that, but I'm kind of moving in the opposite direction. So when you're at the head of an organization like that, how open are you about what you're doing, what you're focusing on, and then what you're trying to hire for? Um, I mean, I think I'm open. Uh, I mean, my, my goal is to be functionally irrelevant. Um, so I mean, I, I mean, ultimately, I would love to be less good at everything in the organization than everyone else that we've hired, um, and let them, you know, run the show, and uh, hopefully they let me, you know, keep my ball of yarn and play around with it in my in my office. Um, but uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I, I think the only way you can go about about hiring is trying to hire people that are better than you at, at every area. Yeah, no, I, I guess I asked from someone else who who's trying to lead a business, and when they're thinking about these things. How important is it laying out the the vision, the the deepest vision that you have for that business, so everyone's on the same page? How far down does that articulate into your business? Yeah, I think that's a good question. I mean, I um, I think we're all going to have uh, overlaps of shared values and shared vision, and then individual vision and values. And I think the goal is that as long as most of it overlaps, um, and I think in adventures in particular, like we're all trying to. Uh, serve our customers, which we think of as the sellers and leadership teams and communities and employee base and uh, vendors and customers, right, of the businesses uh, well, um, and that we'll be taken care of as a result of that. I mean, I think that's the key thing. We want to do it with respect and uh, humility and uh, reliability. Um, I think it's great. Now, now, why I may uh, come to work and why I may do something may be different than somebody else in the organization, and that's okay. Um, but we you know we overlap on a lot of those shared values. To start this conversation, we talked about the importance of who you're surrounding yourself with. And I know on the about you with with adventures, it's really important that you guys have that that no asshole policy. And so when you're hiring people, you're thinking about bringing them onto the team. What are you looking for? Yeah, well,
a lot of the themes you just discussed is making me think about that list you put out on Twitter, of the 10 biggest ideas that changed your life. And I'll make sure this is included in the show notes, but I'm hoping we can dive deeper a little bit on just some of those things in the list. And more importantly, how you distilled that list down. Yeah. So I wrote that list in like a morning that I was bored. I was in Phoenix and um, I just like, I, I, had, I got up really early. It was a two hour time difference. And I was up like way before the dawn. I think I, I got up at like 3.30 that morning. And frankly, I like answered all my emails. And like, I think I even went on like a short walk. And I was like, well, now what am I going to do for three hours before my first meeting? And so I just like sat down and I had read something. I think somebody maybe had tweeted something out about like big ideas or mental models or something like that. And I was like, huh, like, you know, I wonder what my big ideas are. And so I just like literally just hammered them down. And then I was like, you know, I'll clean and kind of clean them up and publish them and see if anybody else has a reaction to it. And then whoosh, uh, it kind of took off. So, um, yeah, it was far less thoughtful than maybe it appears. I don't know. Why do you think it took off? I mean, I, I, I love the ideas you put down. Obviously, they're incredibly impactful. But I'm assuming you didn't think it was going to have that type of pull and explosive resonation with people. Why was that? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't, um, I, I mean, my guess is because people could relate to a lot of them and maybe it's things that, that are obvious that maybe don't seem as obvious. I mean, I think that's what really resonates uh, sort of anywhere. Um, but I mean, look, these are the things that really matter to life. And I, you know, I, I, uh, I think I, if I had to rewrite the list today, maybe I would change a few of them. But I mean, I think the core is still there. Like, I mean, when you look at, um, you know, being rational or what a base rate is or this idea of serving versus being served, um, you know, I, I think these are all things that uh, ring true no matter who you are and where you grew up and what's going on. How do you think this list going public or just putting it out there or even writing it down, how do you think that's affected or impacted your thinking? Uh, I mean, I got plenty of people who who called me out and told me I was wrong, uh, which is always the case whenever uh, you, you put something out there. I mean, I think it also attracts people um, that are like-minded. And so, I mean, I think that's one of the most powerful things about publishing. Uh, it's scary. Um, and uh, certainly people don't always react the way you want them to. But I think one of the positives is it repels the wrong people for you and attracts the right people for you. And so there's been a lot of people who've reached out as a result of reading that and said, hey, I just want to let you know, like, that really resonated with me. And, you know, by the way, if you're ever in fill in the blank, I would love to grab a cup of coffee or, Hey, I've been thinking about the same issue. How, you know, how do you, how do you address this? And so it just, you know, it starts dialogue, it starts conversation, it builds relationships. Um, it's a beautiful thing. Yeah. You mentioned you would probably change a few if you went back and wrote it today. How often do you actually look back to that and just even think from a broader contextual standpoint, what those things are? <laughs> Not often. I mean, I had kids and now I have no no margin in my life, so um, no. I mean, uh, I, you know, I'll occasionally take a look at. It. I mean, somebody will somebody will send me something. I mean, even to today, uh, you know, I'll probably get once or twice a month somebody reaching out and saying, "Hey, I read this list, and um, here's something I've been thinking about as a result of it." It kind of makes me reconsider it, but um, not much time. Are you cool if we dive into a couple of these? Yeah, I would love to just get your current day thoughts. Sure. So, so number two, one that I'm always thinking about is just rationality. So you put in the moment, people act rationally always. The question is what information, preferences, time horizon, and biases come into play? Removes ability to write off people, behavior, forces, learning, and empathy. I'd love for you just to just expand on that. Yeah, I mean, so the, the idea is... Yeah, you know, are people acting irrationally? So when you see somebody acting differently than than you would expect them to act, is it should you? There's one of two reactions you can have. To that you can either say, "Man, people are dumb. What an idiot!" Right, and then just dismiss them. Right, just dumb, just different. And I think that the far better reaction is, "Huh, that's interesting." I my prediction of of what would be their reality would be different than than what they're obviously expressing through their behavior. So why don't I try to understand why would they make that decision? Because like no one in the moment thinks they're making a bad decision or by definition, they wouldn't have made it, right? They're choosing. It depends on preference. It depends on what they're choosing. They're, they're elevating something um, uh, beyond what you would have elevated and they're discounting other things that maybe you would have thought were more important. So, I mean, whether it's somebody doing heroin or buying a new car, or making an investment in a you know quadruple leveraged uh, vehicle or something, right? 
Um, I mean, I like <laughs> there's all kinds of reasons people make decisions. I think mean, this thing, this this way of viewing the world as everything everyone does is rational in the moment um, forces a type of empathy and forces an exploration that doesn't allow you to write people off. And and um, I think that's you know better for you, better for them. No, I, I love just hearing you expand upon these. So this is just getting me fired up right now. Number six was margin of safety and redundancy. And I won't read it all. The listeners can check out the show notes, but I'd love for you to expand on that one as well. Well, I mean, so if you, if you think about just in nature, if you think about uh, how life works, like like stuff happens, right? There are bumper stickers about this. Um, and um, it, it's all about, you know, are you prepared to deal with it? So like, why do we have two eyes, Right. We could, be, we could just have one eye. Well, because if you lose an eye, that's kind of important, right? You need another one just to make sure that you know losing an eye doesn't happen often. And so hopefully if you have two eyes, if you lose one, you, you got the redundancy there, right? So in nature, we're sort of built for redundancy. Um, and then on top of that, if you look in businesses, right, you want to have redundancy of leadership. You want to have redundancy in uh, capital, right? A margin of safety there. You want to buy at a price that, that gives a, a margin of safety. I mean, so there's this recurring theme, and I think it's a it's a core theme of life. If you're not aware of um, this idea of margin of safety and redundancy, you're going to just always run on knife's edge. And and look, knife's edge can work for a really long time. Um, it's kind of like the joke that I think it's either Buffett or Munger says about you know no one knows who's wearing their shorts until the tide goes out. Um, you know, you, you want to make sure that you're somebody who wears shorts and probably two pairs of shorts just in case one of them gets taken out with the tide. Um, and I think this is just that core idea. It's, it has me thinking about when you guys are looking to actually acquire a business, what does the timeline usually look like? Uh, I'm just wondering how many pieces of data are you guys looking for prior to making a decision? Yeah. So the shortest we've ever made an acquisition is in 60 days. And that was extraordinarily rushed. Um, and the longest, we've been working on one deal now for seven and a half years. So, you know, I think we'll probably end up doing deals that are longer than 10 years in the making. Uh, eventually. And I think it just really depends on the situation. Um, but I mean, we're looking for a lot of data points. I mean, trust is a function of consistency over time. And the more trust we can build up and the more predictability we can have, um, the higher the price we can pay. Um, and uh, the more comfortable we can get that we can add value. You said you did one deal in 60 days and you used the word rushed. Was that a bad decision or did you make the right decision? It was just one that was done quicker. Well, that's yet to be proven out. <laughs> 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 so uh, I, I, I hope it wasn't a bad decision. It seems like it's working out pretty well, um, but you, you never know. I mean, that's part of the thing is the feedback loops on deal making um, can be extraordinarily long, and so um, you know a lot of the opportunities that we'll we'll get involved in, uh, we will really know the outcomes for five, ten, maybe even fifteen years. So. For myself personally, if, if I'm looking at making a certain deal, are there any other frameworks or big ideas I should really be thinking about? Well, yeah, there's a lot of things you should be thinking about. <laughs> so I'm trying to I'm trying to figure out uh, where to start. Well, one, why are you the lucky person is always the be the best question to first ask. So if an opportunity comes along to you, um, and I always joke that this is the uh, like Dennis doctor conundrum, right? So if if an opportunity is being shown to a group of doctors. Um, it probably means there have been a lot of other people who are much more qualified and, and much more thoughtful about the opportunity who have passed on it. Um, so, you know, life is just one big collection of selection biases. And you should always ask yourself, okay, why am I in the position to get such a great deal? Uh, why me? Um, that's always the best starting position. If you can't answer it, that should be a gigantic warning flag. No, I asked the broad question for a response like that, that, that. That really is going to help me out moving forward. So thank you for that. I'll, I'll pick up one more from your list of 10 here. And this one seemed to really resonate with a lot of people. And it's forgotten. In 100 years, no one will know my name. I, I would love for you just to riff on that for a second. Well, okay. So if you take a step back, I, I think it, 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 <laughs> it minimizes a lot of uh, things that seem like a big deal in the moment, right? And I struggle with this all the time. I'll get some piece of bad news. Somebody will do something I don't like. And I'll think it's just, it, it, it goes to my core, right? It kind of shakes me. Um, and, and then I think to myself, okay, look, like <laughs> in a hundred years, no one's going to know my name. Uh, very shortly after that, there probably any, any footprint or trace that I ever lived will be gone from the earth. So does it really matter that this person slighted me? Does it really matter that this person maybe did something that cost me some money? Is it really that big a deal? And the answer is, of course not, right? It's just hard to get that uh, perspective 
Um, I also think it's um, <laughs> it tamps down this desire to try to gain um, you know fame and recognition, which is ironic because I mean I'm being interviewed on a podcast, right? So of course, like you know, the, the sort of a little tongue in cheek here, but like n- no one's going to really listen to this thing for very long. And gaining fame and recognition, like so what? Let's become you, know, you become the most well known person, like you know uh, Abraham Lincoln. That's fine. You know the name Abraham Lincoln, but you don't know Abraham Lincoln. Like he's just a person. He's just a person that you know the name. You know some of the stuff of what he did, but you don't know him. So like, what is the purpose of trying to build yourself up into something more than you are? Like, embrace the fact that you've got this one life. Um, no one's going to know your name. Things are not nearly as big a deal as we make them, and enjoy it. Like, relax a little bit. Like, don't take yourself so seriously. Um, and maybe try to think about what are the bigger purposes that you have going on in your life. What can you put your life to that would, you know, planting shade trees for the future, right, is a great example of this. Um, no one's ever sat under a tree that they planted. And so what are some things that you can do that can um, contribute overall? And what's the purpose behind it? And oftentimes we just kind of get distracted. We live in such a, um, gosh, such a distracted economy and such a distracted life. I mean, and by the way, me included, like I, I find myself, you know, r- you know, impulsively refreshing Twitter um, when I should be, you know, playing with my kids. Like, why do I do that? No, I do it because I forget. I forget the bigger purpose. I forget what I'm doing. Um, it just takes these times to like kind of rehone. I mean, a, a, an incredible book is a book actually in the Bible called Ecclesiastes. I mentioned this at the end of my tweet. Um, and it's kind of the smelling salts of life. Actually, I think it's probably the most approachable book uh, in the Bible. And it's probably something that if you've never read Ecclesiastes and have no idea what I'm talking about, if you read it, you'd be shocked that it's in the Bible. Because it kind of, <laughs> it is uh, uh, the repeated thing Solomon um, in the book says, uh, everything is like chasing the wind. And it's true. We are all chasing the wind. And so what are you going to do with this life that's been given to you? That's what we all have to figure out. Wow. That, uh, you went way deeper there than I, I could have even hoped for. So so thank you for expanding upon that. And it even just has me thinking. I, I wanted to reach out to you. I, I didn't have a relationship with you prior. I didn't know you. And I wanted to have you on for a while. So then what made you even say yes to coming on the podcast after what you just said? Yeah, I mean, I, I think this is part of it is anybody who reaches out to me, I try to be kind and responsive to them. And if somebody's nice enough to say, I'd love to have you on my, my podcast, uh, unless I have a really good reason for saying no, I try to be generous and say yes. Um, I mean, obviously, you're kind to invite me on. Um, you know, if we're not going to be helpful and, and kind towards one another, we're like, what else are we doing? I mean, so you can make much more money by closely guarding your time, by being ruthless for you know how you schedule things out, for saying no all the time, which is kind of a meme that everyone loves to say. It's like, great. So you, you arrived at the end of your life. You were hyper, you know, hyper uh, efficient with your time. You have ripped six pack abs as a 65 year old, right? You have no friends, or maybe the friends you have are, are incredibly uh, tight with you, right? And you have a, a huge pile of money. Okay, great. <laughs> like you've lived for yourself this entire time. Like you will end up miserable, right? I mean, that's like the end of the day. Like the only thing that will give us true pleasure in this life is by serving others. And, and I think that's part of it is, you know, when people reach out, try to serve them, try to be kind. No, well, thank you for serving, uh, coming on here. It was, it was one, a lot of the listeners, you've actually been one of the most requested guests. So this is really exciting. And we've received a lot of questions, both from email and then on social media. So are you cool? If we do a few quick hit questions from the listeners. Yeah, absolutely. Of course. Cool. So someone wanted to know, what are some of the benefits you've seen from going caffeine free? <laughs> Well, okay, so the story on caffeine free. So my right retina started detaching. Um, apparently, um, it, it is a cortisol related issue, which you know may mean I'm stressed out. Like the doctor, um, he said, uh, um, "Well, I just need you to take some time off work." And I was like, "Okay, that's not going to work right now." And he's like, "Okay, well, just you know, tamp down your home life. And, you know, how's your home life?" And I said, "Well, I have three young kids." And he was like, "Oh gosh, okay." huh, I'm not sure what to advise you do. And I said, is there anything else that could be causing this? And he goes, well, how much coffee do you drink? And I said, well, yeah, I don't know, three, five, seven cups a day, depending on the day and how tired I am and how many times I got up in the middle of the night. And he goes, yeah, okay, that could be it. Why don't you just go off caffeine? And I was like, excuse me? Like I hadn't, I, you know, I had not, not had a cup of coffee for, gosh, I don't know, 15 years at least, maybe longer. And, um, it felt like I had the flu for about the first four or five days um, going off of it. It was awful. And then, you know, the new normal kind of, and you know, like reemerged and, and now I don't need it anymore. And it feels great. My 
Um, anxiety levels are way less. Like I come with, a, you know, I, I, I used to have crippling anxiety and, and uh, certainly was exacerbated by caffeine. And I just can't imagine ever going back now. So I would say, uh, you know, naturally caffeinated. Uh, I feel better or as good as I used to after a cup of coffee when I first wake up in the morning. Uh, far less anxiety, for, far less like just amped up in general. Um, I think my reactions are better. Um, it's just kind of like, I don't know how to say it, like caffeine now, looking back on it, like kind of you're overclocking your CPU all the time. And that's going to have consequences. There's no free lunch. I always hate these success stories because I'm a, a coffee lover as well. And I feel like it, it right now, it's just too difficult for me to, to contemplate that. But I'm so glad you're having so much success with that. What about what's one productivity hack you use? Gosh, productivity hack. I don't um, have really good friends that you can call and ask questions. I mean, I don't, I don't know. I don't like, I don't have a, I mean, I don't have a whole lot of, you know, like, uh, you know, traditional productivity hacks. I mean, I, uh, I don't think I'm very productive in general. And um, yeah, I mean, honestly, like whenever I have something that I'm really facing that I can't, it's not sort of non-obvious you know, calling people who are for me, who, who care about me and who I trust, who I can say, Hey, here's what's on my heart. And I'm, I'm struggling with this. Um, you know, whether it's personal or professional has, has really just been a huge godsend. Yeah. I don't think there's a better resource than having people that you can reach out to in times like that. What about what's one idea from your book, Messy Marketplace that's grown in salience and might be more important than you first thought? I think this idea that everyone's going through the same problems uh, is something that I, I, I believe before, but I, I much more even appreciate now um, that the amount of people that have reached out that are um, how different they are and have said that they, a lot of the ideas resonated with them. I mean, I had a CEO of a gosh, 17, $18 million earning business a year who reached out and said, okay, there's a lot of things in this book that I always felt too stupid to say I didn't know. And thank you for putting them out there. And I was like, Wow, here's a guy who's like a titan of business, who's leading this incredible family business, who he just never felt comfortable asking, quote unquote, the dumb questions. And um, so it really kind of opened my eyes to the fact that no matter where your station in life is, there's just sort of a base of knowledge that no one ever tells you. Like, here's how transactions are done. Here's what you need to think about. Here's how you need to think about it. Um, It just honestly, it just shocks me. Yeah, don't be afraid to ask those questions and be the dumbest person in the room. One final listener question. What's a business to buy right now for around 150000 that they could continue to work outside of their 9-to-5 job? Well, so there's quite a few um, uh, internet-based businesses. I actually just uh, uh, had a guy come into town recently and paid me a visit who uh, is in the process of buying one. And, um, you know, you can get SBA loans for them. Um, you know, it's going to have to be something that is, um, you know, either can run itself if you want to maintain your nine to five job. It's got to be either, um, you know, remote um, or self-managed. And so, you know, if you didn't have the $150,000 constraint, I'd say go up market and buy a much larger company that already has leadership in place and sort of be the board of directors for that business, um, at $150,000, I think it'd be stretched to find something. And it was sort of conversely, if you said, um, you know, I, I, I want to buy it for 150,000, but I'm willing to quit my job. I think there's a whole array of businesses, you know, in home services, um, especially that I think are ripe for, um, uh, disruption and out competition. Um, but the, the constraint of those two things together, I mean, that is, that is a tough one. Um, cause you certainly no no small business is going to be passive. Right, so this idea that you're just going to, you know, buy a small business and not be involved in it is uh, idiotic. Uh, this is not going to happen. Um, and so, you know, you'll just really have to have something that's maybe internet-based, um, maybe e-commerce-based of some sort. Um, yeah, I don't know. That's really tough. That's so far outside of my uh, at least recent wheelhouse. I feel like that would have been a better question for me like seven or eight years ago. Yeah, no worries. I, I appreciate you answering some of these listener questions. Yeah, no, no. I'll try to think on that. That's one that. Um, let me think on that. Maybe we could uh, ping ping me on Twitter, you know, uh, or maybe we can remember and I'll try to tag you in on this. And maybe that'd be something fun to brainstorm on Twitter. I think people have some really good ideas that I think, um, you know, it could be could be helpful for that person. Yeah, we can definitely do that. So Brent, a reoccurring theme that kept coming up is, is you mentioning the people that you're able to reach out to, grab lunch with, make a phone call to. When, you, when you're sitting down with someone and, and you're trying to, I don't want to say accumulate some of the knowledge they have, but you're just trying to learn from them. Is there anything you do, any ways you approach those conversations? 
Well, I think, you know, especially early on, being really knowledgeable about who they are, uh, reading things they've written, reading things that have been written about them, understanding their their background, their history, anything you can uh, discern from without asking them, I think is really helpful. So you can just jump ahead of a lot of stuff. So, um, you know, it, 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 one of the things I try to do is just kind of collect a dossier on somebody as much as I can possibly know about them. And then when I sit down with them, I can, you know, I don't have to say like, okay, so early in your career, you did this, like, tell me about that. Cause I've already read about it. Right. Unless I'm really, really interested in, in, in that specific thing. And so I would just say, just do your homework and your background. Um, and then, you know, be humble and, and, and people can tell if you're genuinely interested in learning about them, or if you're just trying to squeeze them for something. Right. It's, it's like a very obvious thing and almost everyone can tell. And so I would say it's going with a genuine, um, you know, position of, of humility and saying, hey, look, I want to I want to know you. I want to get to know you and not just, you know, kind of suck you dry. <laughs> if that makes sense. <laughs> no, that um, absolutely does. And, uh, and I think too often, I mean, look, I did this, and, and by the way, I still even do this today. I get starstruck. You know, I had a conversation recently with somebody who's, you know, multi-billionaire and, and you know, uh, has done a lot of, you know, the same things that I uh, aspire to do someday. And, you know, I just got starstruck and just started pounding them with self-serving questions. And, you know, about halfway through, I was like, man, this is really offensive. I'm sorry. I wasn't meaning to do this. And the person was super gracious about it. And I just said, can we take a step back? I want to hear about you. Like, Ask them about their fears. Ask them about what worries them, what they wish they had done better. Um, like genuinely getting to know them as opposed to just, you know, hey, I want to get my three nuggets so I can enter them into my moleskin journal so that now I'm smarter and I can at least seem like I'm smarter, right? All very good points. I think we can all learn a lot from that. So, so something I'm really intrigued about, and I want to know if you're still into, I know you've been a huge fan of wine in the past. Is that still true? Well, if you, I, I drink a lot. Um, I, I don't know. Well, I know you were making wine at a point, weren't you? <laughs> I did make wine. Um, yeah, it sounds far more glamorous and exciting than it really is. Um, so, so winemaking is uh, is largely farming uh, c- combined with some chemistry. And it turns out uh, that making wine is a far less desirable, less enjoyable experience than drinking wine. And so uh, did make wine, uh, stopped making wine, and now, now we just drink wine. Nothing wrong with that. I don't know. A few things I enjoy more than a nice glass of wine uncorking a bottle over some memorable conversations. So Brent, I, I've been able and fortunate enough to learn from you over the years. I know the listeners are very excited about this, but what's next for you and, and adventures? I, I think we're just going to keep doing more or what we've already been doing. Um, we, uh, we intend to keep you know, uh, acquiring, partnering with um, family-held businesses. Uh, we think there's an incredible tsunami of opportunities that are getting ready to, to come down. If you look at who owns these businesses, it's uh, you know dominated by people who are aging and who need to uh, figure out how they're going to transition the business. Most of them do not have a uh, son or daughter to pass the business down to. Most of them are not uh, in a position, nor would it be prudent for them to do an ESOP. And so, um, you know, uh, there's not a lot of options. And so we would like to be a good long-term home for those businesses, um, provide them with a kind, reliable um, owner that can maintain the family atmosphere. And um, so, yeah, so we're going to keep doing what we're doing. We've, you know, we've been blessed with um, great people who've joined us in recent years. We've made a couple of really big uh, recent hires that I'm excited about. We'll, we'll talk more about in upcoming, um, kind of upcoming letters. But um, just doing more of what we're already doing. We built the systems, you know, we kind of toiled away in obscurity for a long time and, and really honed our skills. And, and now it's about, you know, scaling and, and doing it bigger. So just keep doing what we're doing. We love it. I'm the best job in the world. Well, that's very exciting to hear. I know the listeners can find you in a lot of different places uh, with the book, the writings you do, the company, and then yourself personally. Where do you want them going? I mean, if you if you want to email me, uh, my email is just uh, the, the first letter of either my first or my last name at Adventures. Uh, so dot before the ES um, at Brent Bishore on Twitter is probably actually I think I've, I've opened DMs. So DM me on Twitter, at me on Twitter, um, I'm on there quite a bit. Um, yeah, any way I can be helpful, let me know. Brent, well, you've been incredibly helpful over the years just with, with what you put out publicly. So thank you so much for, for being so humble coming on the podcast that I really do appreciate it. Well, thanks, Sean. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me on. Each week, so many amazing podcasts come out. Unfortunately, we just don't have the time to listen to them all. That's why I love Podcast Notes. 
What Podcast Notes does is they write up some of the top podcasts and top episodes with their tips, takeaways, and quotes so you get everything you need out of that episode without having to spend all that time listening. They also have an unbelievable weekly newsletter. And this weekly newsletter has the takeaways from the top business, health, and lifestyle podcasts. It's one of the few newsletters I subscribe to and certainly think you guys would love checking it out. So remember, it's podcastnotes.org and also subscribe to that weekly newsletter they're putting out. Making change transpire. That's the mission behind the most amazing tasting protein bar brand taking the nutrition industry by storm. That brand They're MCT Co., and they make the most delicious, keto-friendly, all-natural collagen protein bars. If you're obsessed with the quality of food going into your body like I am, then head out and pick up these amazing bars jammed with 10 grams of collagen protein. They only have two to three net carbs, no added sugar, and loaded with high-quality MCT oil for the healthy fats from coconuts. Whether you're busy running the kids around from activity to activity, a professional athlete, or just someone looking for a great tasting convenience snack, do yourself a favor, head to mctco.com and use code WGYT for 20% off your order. Do you guys miss your favorite childhood cereals but had to give them up because of all the sugar? Meet Catalina Crunch, the world's first keto-friendly, zero-sugar cereal in delicious dark chocolate, cinnamon toast, maple waffle, and honey graham. When the founder of Catalina Crunch was diagnosed at age 17 with type 1 diabetes, he set out to satisfy his chocolate craving and created his own. This low-carb, zero-sugar cereal will power you through the day with 10 grams of plant-based protein, 6 grams grams of fiber to fill you up and is also gluten-free, grain-free, dairy-free, and 100% plant-based. Don't forget about that turmeric as well to help fight inflammation and boost immunity. If you want to enjoy and receive 10% off your entire order, head to CatalinaCrunch.com. That's Catalina, C-A-T-A-L-I-N-A, Crunch.com, and use code WGYT10 for 10% off. I just finished snacking on some of the dark chocolate, and it was delicious. You guys need to head out and pick some up today. You guys made it to the end of another episode of What Got You There. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I really do appreciate you taking the time to listen all the way through. If you found value in this, the best way you can support the show is giving us a review, rating it, sharing it with your friends, and also sharing on social. I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. Looking forward to you guys listening to another episode. If you guys enjoyed the smooth sounds of today's episode, then you can thank Brian Lapries, our sound engineer, And if you enjoyed the intro song, check out Justin Great, the man behind it. I can't thank you guys enough for listening. Looking forward to you tuning in next time. What got you there with Shonda Laney? Uh, What got you there with Shonda Laney? What got you there with Shonda Laney? Uh, What got you there with got you, got you?